Hey, me, buddy, we've got more cool Sonic Reactor experiments to try out. Now, this is based on all of your feedback from the previous experiment here, and we're going to try out a few more ideas to see if we can find a more optimal arrangement. Not only that, there's been a good amount of discussion over here on the Discord channel, and this video was recorded while live streaming here on Discord. So it was a team effort. So thank you to everybody on Discord for helping me out and keeping me company through this long, relatively boring experience. So Meep, you ready to make some more power? Then let's roll the experiments. Okay, so in this test here, I'm experimenting with a much larger loop. So we have a fair bit more salt gas that's able to move up and around. It's not as restricted as just having one single tile that kind of moves like this. With two, you can move quite a bit more volume. So maybe that has a big effect on how much we're able to pull out of the salt gas. And right down here, I'm just retesting this original design and then comparing it with an automated signal here just to kind of see if we get the same sort of numbers on the way out or if my readings might potentially be off because this one is running continuously. Okay, so when I look at the results here, we get 126% for this one up top, and then the one down below is 128%. So it's awesome to see that uh, the experiment is actually giving me good data here, even though these numbers are different, right? So we have six tons of molten aluminum because it's running continuous down here. You have 2,370. However, these numbers still balance out in the end, which means we get uh, a summary of what has actually happened. As far as the result for the larger loop up here, this really didn't work out as well. This was only 76%, so really quite inefficient for whatever reason. All right, so for test number 10 here, we've got the infinity loop set up here. We've got the one down below. This one's going to be bringing in the molten aluminum continuously. Uh, we can see that there's still a little bit of phase change going on here. The one different thing that we did this time is we put the temperature shift plate right here in the corner, which should be pulling thermal energy out of here and pushing it up there, maybe a little bit more effectively. Above that, we also have the same thing set up, but with an automation signal here. We'll see how that uh, makes a difference to the same design. Okay, so for the last system here, we're running a triple chamber, but this time we're trying to control and condense all of the different chambers here using a heat conveyor. So this is a thermium heat conveyor. It has 20 kilograms each, and the cold side is right up here on top. We'll reverse this and see how that, if that makes any difference. You can see that I have a little bit of automation here. I put the liquid sensor right here in the middle. So hopefully we bring in enough to convert all of this to gas. Once we see that we have gas, all of this shuts down, and that's when we take the energy out. We'll see just how efficient that is. I think the key here is putting that liquid element sensor maybe right up there. I don't know. Okay, so the results are in for all three of these experiments here, and one of them actually performed really well. However, one of them did not perform all that well. Let's start off with this one right down here. So this is the sort of infinity loop. We just put a temperature shift plate inside of here. This performed at 134%, so not bad, but not all that great. Uh, the one above this with a little bit of automation here actually performed at 202%, so really quite effective. However, it's still running quite slow, so it's not really a high-speed operation. When you compare this to the previous setup that did not have the temperature shift plate right here, well, that one actually performed quite a bit better at 250%. So we've yet to come up with anything that's actually better than stuff we've already done. So the triple doors using the heat conveyor in the background actually performed at 64%, which is one of the worst numbers we've seen yet. I'm gonna try flipping the bridge to see if it works any better, but so far, this doesn't look to be all that promising. <sighs> Let's try to adjust this automation real quick. We'll put this up over here, like this. All right, so when this one closes, you can see that the cold should be right here, which means we condense from the bottom. Ooh, okay. Yeah, reversing that conveyor might make a big difference here. I'll be curious to see how this one runs. The only difference we made in this chamber down here is I moved the liquid element sensor from the bottom left of both of these loops to the bottom left of the topmost loop. Maybe that makes a difference. All right, so the results are in, and yet again, just like we had last time with the conveyor running in the opposite direction, this one only gave us about an 80% throughput, so it was actually less, surprisingly, somehow. I don't understand it anymore. <laughs> However, this one down here showed really good promise in that it was 187%. However, the throughput was about three times as much of that as it was without the automation. So when this guy was right down here, we had the same sort of efficiencies, but it was only through putting 2,400 kilograms of water. This one here is doing 9,200. So a lot more throughput. So as far as the arrangements, this is the best one we've discovered thus far. 
this arrangement down here, not too good. Uh, you definitely need to automate the input somehow in order to get the most out of it. All right, so for this test, I'm going to be running the B power block here. So what we have is we have a bunker door and then we've got two phase change chambers going on down here. So you got the one on the bottom, which is mostly salt gas, and the one on top, which is controlled by an atmos sensor. So once it goes above a certain pressure, then we start to pull energy out of this. So you can see that this will tip over here pretty soon, hopefully. And there we go. Now it closes down and we start to take a little bit of power out of here. So maybe this will work out pretty good. The next idea here is basically taking the infinity loop and doubling it up. I've already thought of another way of to arrange this, but essentially what we got is this same setup right here, which has already proven itself to be pretty good. And then we've add a second one in line here, which can use either the waste product from the first loop or the bypass from the first loop to kind of run a second loop here. All of this comes back to the same sort of tiles right here, which then goes into the radiator. So we'll see how that works. Maybe more is better. All right, so this system right up here actually did some interesting things. It, one, operated fairly efficiency, uh, fairly efficient at 160%. So that's a little bit lower than what we've seen with some of the other double loop arrangements here, a little less efficient. However, its throughput was a fair bit more. We're up to 11 and a half tons worth of uh, water that was able to make its way through in the same 600 seconds. So technically we got more throughput, but a little less efficient. The B power block down here was not very powerful at all, unfortunately. It operated at 90% efficiency and just didn't really have that great of throughput, only about seven tons or so. So it looks like the loops are the clear winners right here. Finding a way to optimize this for either two loops or maybe some more loops in order to increase the throughput seems to be about the only way forward. If you start to take a look at some of the materials we have here, there are better options than diamond. I've stuck with diamond and steel through this entire test because I wanted to figure out what arrangements were, you know, the best for our needs here. But now that I've kind of focused in on one arrangement that I like, we're going to try to work on the materials here to see if we can improve these numbers a little bit. All right, so now we're using the best material I have available to me, tungsten which is technically available. I mean, you, you could get your hands on tungsten if you dig up a lot of biomes, eventually. <laughs> and now we've got a double system going on down here. Let's just call it a double pumper. And it's pumping heat into this right there and right there based on the automation signal coming from above. So whether or not we have gas here or not determines whether we run on the left side or the right side. Now, what I'm not seeing is that this salt gas down here is never condensing. Let's go ahead and tweak this just a little bit. Okay, we're gonna put a little filter gate on this. We're gonna fix everything with automation. See, this one's doing it. See, it drips down, drips down, goes back in. 10 seconds is pretty good. Needs to be a little bit more though. Uh, just, a, just a touch more. 13 for test 13. That's the magic number. Ooh, yeah. All right, so here we go. Let's see the power, baby. Bring it on. Three, two, point one. Holy moly! This bad boy right here put out 350%. Now we're talking. Mmm! Give me some of that power, baby. Yeah! It wasn't all for nothing. <laughs> oh, how many hours have we put into this? These are some hard-earned kilowatts. Yeah, the second run here, which was done at a slightly slower game speed, actually resulted in 400%. So, that was... This works really good. <laughs> An extra 50%. Boom! So I guess all we can do here is just keep tweaking things to see if we can make them a little bit better and better, but... Just to go over the, the setup here once again, um, all of these tiles that I'm using here are made out of tungsten. Uh, each chamber has 600 kilograms of salt inside of it and I have two filter gates set up over here to 13 seconds each uh, And then we have the output which is this is just a liquid element sensor looking for molten salt right down there The pipes are a little bit spaghetti like down here, but essentially we have one input which is all the molten aluminum coming in, and that can run through the heat exchanger right here using tungsten radiant pipes. Um, and the discharge can also be used 
as an inlet for the second chamber over here. So it either bypasses like this, or it continues to go through all of that. And then it finds its way out, which in our case would be just going back to the tank, which would then recirculate back to this side. So if we really look back at all the different steps that we took to get here, we ended up creating kind of this certain infinity loop. And then once we placed the element sensor in the second chamber up here, that's when we saw a much more stable operation, something that wasn't overheating. So I think that was the key to our automation there. Tungsten transfer tiles up here above the mechanized airlock is probably important. Although, hey, you know what? Right now I'm using a steel door. You could always use more doors here. I don't know if that'd be more efficient though. After these promising results, we ended up playing around with the materials a little bit here and even trying some modded doors in between there. We tried to fit in gold where we could and whatnot, but none of the results that we were able to get back were better than the ones that we just received right there. So ultimately using the tungsten tiles on all the corners as you see right there, and then a steel mechanized airlock in between the two was the best result that we had. All right, so all of this comes together here in this final experiment. I'm bringing back the steam turbines for better or for worse. <laughs> Essentially, what we have going on here is the exact same setup for all of these team steam turbines here. So they are running at the exact same temperature and they have the exact same amount of steam down here below. So that's 400 kilograms over obsidian drywall with tungsten tiles down here on the bottom. This sensor is set to 185 degrees Celsius. You can only make the heat can go only go in through the door right there. And then I'm going to store up the amount of power right here over 600 seconds, one complete cycle, and then compare just how much heat was lost with the amount of aluminum that goes through here. So the input temperature is 1,800 degrees Celsius. We'll see what it is on the output there. So that way we can see how many DTUs we had to push into the system and how many watts we got out of it or how many kilojoules. And then right down here, we have the exact same thing set up. And then right down here on the bottom, we have the exact same thing set up, but with a little bit of petroleum down here. That's a popular topic. So I've let these things heat up and run for a good long time here. They are all pretty much right around the same power wattage, pretty close. They jump up near 850 watts and then kind of slowly drop down just into the 700s for just a moment here. So I flick this on for a second, right? You see that the automation goes through, we turn it off and now we are collecting power. We've got the power shut off. So the kilojoules are flowing in here and then I will compensate for the amount of kilojoules lost by all of these batteries. In my final calculation, there are 25 batteries in total per steam turbine. <laughs> That's how many batteries we need. It, these things put out a lot of juice. Okay, so there we are at the very end of the test. You can see that these batteries were just about filled up. 18.3 kilojoules in that one single battery right there. 16.8 right up there in that one. And then slightly less 15.6 down here on the bottom one. All right, so counting up the power up here, we have 16.8 kilojoules per battery. We have 26 batteries, so 26 times 16.8. And then we add in the amount that is lost from the batteries um, because they actually lose power over time. So that is another 10.4 kilojoules right there, which means that produced 447.2 kilojoules. If you take a look at this liquid reservoir right here, we have six tons, which is perfect. And you can see the temperature 1,685 degrees. So this right here lost a total of 115 degrees Celsius from its input temperature to the output or 627 million DTUs. So that means right there, we spent 1,404 DTUs per watt. All right, so now let's compare this to this next system. So this system down here produced just a little bit more power at 486 kilojoules. Now the very revealing thing here is going to be the temperature of this aluminum. Ooh, see that? 1,751 degrees. And it didn't even move all the molten aluminum through it. So it wasn't running that entire time, believe it or not. Interesting. So what this means here is that we only spent 240 million DTUs in order to generate this amount of power, which is an amazing difference when you compare it to what we spent up above, which was over 600 million. So when you take all those DTUs and you divide them by the little teeny tiny joules, look at this number. Boom, you profit. That's 495 DTUs per watt. Boom, which as you guessed it is right in line with our previous experiments right there more power. 
That's actually 283%. So this bad boy right down here works and I can confirm it. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at this bottom one though. This is kind of an interesting setup and it has to do with this petroleum here. Popular request, not something I really want to get into here, but in this arrangement, the heat travels up through the mechanized airlock, through the tungsten, and then it has to go through the petroleum in order to get into the steam. If you had a building inside of here, it, I'm sure it kind of acts a little bit different. But with that disclaimer out of the way, let's take a look at what this power looks like. We've got 15.6 kilojoules per spot right there. So that's a total of 416 kilojoules, slightly less than our previous two systems. Now let's take a look at the temperature here, 1722.2, and it moved a total of 5600 kilograms. So when we burn 396, 468,800 <laughs> DTUs for 416,000 joules, we end up with 953 DTUs per watt. So better than our standard result, but far less than not using any petroleum in this particular arrangement. So in conclusion, yes, we absolutely can boost the power coming from a very hot molten source like molten aluminum over here. If we run it through a salt gas boiler right here, we do gain a huge amount of energy out of it. Matter of fact, we gained quite a bit more than what I was expecting with our best result being 283%. There might even be room to tune things a little bit more and optimize different variables, such as how we work with the steam turbine a little bit more to get even more power out of this. For something that is a relatively low effort thing, which is just building this arrangement right here, that's a pretty good number. And I think it's definitely worth doing, especially if you're going to go to all the effort of making molten aluminum or something like that <laughs> in the first place. However, I think there might be one idea that generates even more power than this. What if we were to take molten salt, run it into a thermium pump here at right around 900, maybe 950 degrees Celsius, and then neck it down to less than one kilogram packets, and then counterflow that across molten aluminum, all the way up to its maximum temperature, as high as you can get it, and then output it as a gas. Hmm, how much power would we generate then? Well, that sounds like another video for another time. Thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this little episode here of Oxygen Not Included. If you got some ideas for me, go ahead and leave them down there in the comment section below. As always, stay awesome, guys. Peace. Brothgar, out.